closely until you've just published this. And uh, so my question might not be that great, but um, last year, phenylephrine, like Sudafed, was found to just not be, not work, just to be a placebo. And uh, how did it get approved in the first place? Well, they used an endpoint that they thought was a good uh, corollary or whatever for sure. the... Uh, actual thing that they're looking at, and is there a possibility that the endpoint oh, here canceled. is sort of like uh, malleable like that, where it can show positive results and yeah. not be related to Alzheimer's? That's an awesome question. So I actually think it's the opposite, because the, all, the endpoint is cognition. And the problem with Alzheimer's is we really want to see the cognition change, which would be the home run. Imagine somebody decaying from Alzheimer's, and then all of a sudden they're decay stops or reverses. It'd be amazing. But the problem with Alzheimer's is we're defining the disease as a cognitive disease when we should be looking at the disease process that begins 20, 25 years before the cognition actually fails. So people with Alzheimer's and people with genes that cause Alzheimer's, the amyloid beta and the tau that, that builds up in this disease starts 20 years before the memory fades. So <clears throat> the drugs that help the memory like uh, Aricept and so forth, they work on a like a short term. They don't modify the disease. They're just sort of amping up the brain's cognition. This drug doesn't do that. Um, but even if it sort of was a good idea, they're testing it far too late in the disease path uh, pathogenesis, where the patient's you know looking at five years left to live usually. Um, you want to treat Alzheimer's twenty years ago and. It's very hard to do that because you have to wait a long time for a clinical trial to, to come out with. And that's why you might want to look at a surrogate endpoint like amyloid beta levels or some other neuronal damage level. And, you know, that would be a good thing to do. So they're really testing like the important endpoint, which is cognition. The only more important endpoint would be survival. So the surrogate is actually where they should go because that is more realistic. And it's probably better to treat the disease that way. This is a lot like treating third line metastatic lung cancer, which is like after you fail two attempts to treat the cancer, you, you're this is on your third attempt. Usually, no matter what tumor type it is, that's like a three six month kind of survival, and it's very hard to improve in that in that disease setting. So, you know, th th that's sort of the equivalent here. When if you treat the cancer before it spreads, you have a much better chance of of actually dealing with it molecularly. By the time it's the end, everything's going wrong molecularly and in the systems and the cells that there's no real one way to sort of save the ship from sinking. But early days of cancer, you can. So I think that that sort of analogy does work uh, for what's happening here. And that alone is a good enough reason to short cassava. Forget the people that got arrested or sued for fraud. Forget the pharmacokinetics. Forget the mechanism of action. Just the idea that they're doing a late stage Alzheimer's trial, it's 98% so far that have failed. So why buy a stock where, you know, you might lose 98%? Well, if it's 1% of your portfolio, great. You know, but the people out there that have huge positions, you know, they, they should trim. But the people who, who you know, you have 5% of your portfolio in this, look, you know, you're going to learn something. You're either going to learn that you're better at biotech stock picks than Martin Shkreli, or you're going to learn that you're not as good. <laughs> and if you're better than me at biotech stock picks, there's hundreds of more drugs to come out that you can prove. And you know, I'll, I'll go back to my hole, I'll become a computer program, I'll do something else. But my career has been in doing exactly this. And I'll be right on this one, and anybody along will be wrong. So if you want to test your, your acuity, your ability to do this, just do it with a small amount. You know, it's kind of like you know, your first fight in MMA, you put your life savings on it. Well, you don't know if you're good at MMA yet. Why would you do that? I'm Brock Lesnar, I'm gonna beat you up. And if you wanna bet that you're better than me, Start small. Don't go all in. You know, if in your first poker hand, do you, do you mortgage your house and, and go all in on your first poker hand? It would probably be better if you play poker for a long time. If you start, you want to play for money to start, start with, a, you know, a couple of dollars slowly. And then, you know, as you get more confident and more successful, put more money in. But I think a lot of people here are excited about, oh my gosh, I, I can make 100x or 1000x. Let me, let me just put half my portfolio in this. And that's just irresponsible and nuts. A lot of people have that gamble, that itch that they want to scratch in gambling. And honestly, no matter what I say, I don't think I could help those people. And they're going to do what they're going to do regardless. But, you know, when I shorted this stock called Mankind years ago and I published about it, 
a lot of people thanked me and they said, you know, you got me out of that stock and I would have lost all my money and I appreciate it. And Daniel Kahneman and uh, Tversky, his partner, wrote a lot about this like behavioral um, economics thing where losses, the fear of losses is much less scary than the, the excitement of gain. And so people will do reckless and risky things because they feel that gain potentially coming and they'll ignore all the, the, the bad stuff. And they'll feel like, why be prudent when I might be rich? And you know, those people are not good investors. But there's nothing I can say that's going to change their mind. I, I can only say, like, you have nothing to. Let, let me just finish. Let me just finish. Corey, you're, Corey, you're feedbacking too. Um, so let me just say this real quick. You have nothing to prove to anybody, right? Like, if, if you're good at biotech picks, you will make tons of money. You will become a billionaire. I know somebody that became a billionaire just betting on binary events. If you're really good at this, it doesn't matter if you have 1%, 10%, or 100% of your portfolio, because there'll be another Sava, and be because obviously you're very good at this, because you've got it right, you will continue to make money in future Savas. You have nothing to prove that you're the best, <laughs> that, you know, 100% of your portfolio. If this could cause you financial harm, reduce your position, you'll still make money on the win. If uh, this is a reasonable size position for you, I wish you luck. I hope you make a ton of money. I think I'm going to make the money, not you, but I'll survive if, if I'm wrong and you'll survive if you're wrong. What I don't like to see is somebody that's all in and putting their financial livelihood on the line over something they don't even understand because they read about it on some message board or something. But if you have a responsible bet of 5%, 10%, quite frankly, that's still a lot, uh, or 1%, God bless you. But if you're here 50% or 100%, I, I just feel like I have to say something. Uh, anyway, Corey, you want to say something? Oh, I, I just wanted to say I respect all the work that you've done on this bet. I had come to a similar conclusion even after being long Saba on the way up and being so hopeful about it. But as more and more data came out, I really didn't reconcile it. And so I switched. Uh, and I, I hope I'm actually wrong because I think that this kind of drug and this kind of data that they, you know, originally it showed before all the, the nonsense came out about it being adjusted and so forth. Uh, that kind of drug would just change so many people's lives. Having been personally impacted with family members who've had Alzheimer's, I think that I just, I would hope somebody in the, the next few years with all this technology that's coming out will invent some way to uh, address this need. But I just wanted to say, like, I understand that it's super risky for everybody. A lot, there's a lot of positioning going on here. Uh, and I just hope that people are making wise decisions for themselves. Oh, thanks, Corey. And um, what I'd say is I, I made a tweet just recently that Alzheimer's is going to bankrupt America and the world. As we get older and older, we solve cardiovascular issues. Unfortunately, not for my father. But for many people, cardiovascular issues like blood pressure and lipids are disappearing. Diabetes as well. And that just means we're going to be 80 and 90 and 100. And that just means we're going to die from Alzheimer's. At this rate, we have no Alzheimer's drugs. Cassava is not going to help. But we need Alzheimer's drugs, and we hope that we can get some Alzheimer's drugs. The problem, and Bill Ackman responded to my tweet and thought it was a good idea. Um, recently, I tweeted that there, there should be exclusivity uh, for anybody that wants to make an Alzheimer's drug. Their, their patent life should not matter. If you make an Alzheimer's drug, you should get 10 or 20 years of patent life automatically. And FDA has done this before with orphan drugs. There was such a need for orphan drugs because Big Pharma didn't care to make them, that um, they made an incentive, a seven-year incentive. No matter what your patent was, situation was, you get seven years no matter what. And so I propose you know, a 10 or 15-year similar thing for Alzheimer's because we need to incentivize people to do these really long trials. A friend of mine, as I mentioned, is an Alzheimer's startup guy, and he said, Martin, even if we had that, I don't think I could afford to do a five or 10-year clinical trial. And there are ways of handling that, but we really have never dealt with a disease that's a 30-year progressive disease and that when you get the symptoms in year 25, you just fall off a cliff. So it's a very odd illness. We need to stop the disease from year one to year 25. Trying to stop it at year five doesn't do anything. And we don't have that many tools and clues on how to do this. So it's a tough spot. Um, and, you know, when I look at these uh, companies, again, you know, I have a heart, uh, a lot of different illnesses in my family. Uh, I, I want people to be healthier. I want us to apply science to get that. But at the same time, the drugs 
structure is set in stone. It will not change no matter how much you or I say nice things or say bad things. The, mole the molecule is the molecule. The atoms are where they are. And the drug either works or it doesn't. You know, we cannot change with our hopes and dreams whether a phase three works. And this phase three will not work. Uh, I'm dead certain of this. And, you know, if you want to donate to charity, that's fine. Um, but I ultimately think that, you know, this isn't charity. You can donate to an academic lab that's researching Alzheimer's. That's a much better use of your money. Um, so in any event, um, I think there's just a lot of greed from people who are along the stock. They just hope that they can make 100x and they make it the easy way. And they will learn that this is not the easy way to make money. It's the easy way to lose it. Uh, Contressin or anybody else, do you want to say anything? I should probably head out pretty soon here. Anybody? Anybody at all? Hey, uh, I'm a physician. I agree with your thesis, just looking at it. Did you talk about why you think the stock's pumping up like 23% today? Great question. So uh, I'm glad you agree, Juan. Um, stocks are weird things. You know, over 25 years I've, of trading, uh, literally professionally at hedge funds and for myself, uh, you know, I, I'm reminded of Elon. So Elon Pharmaceuticals, which no longer exists, made the first A-beta antibody um, called Bapinizumab. And there was a book written about it called Black Edge. And Bapinizumab um, looked great. It was the first drug to ever, you know, interact with, with the causal, <laughs> what most people felt was the causal problem with Alzheimer's, amyloid beta aggregation. And uh, the drug, the stock went up a ton uh, right before their data came out. The data was bad and the stock dropped 90% and the phase threes failed. I think that there's exciting anticipation. For example, at Powerball, a lot of people buy their ticket right before <laughs> the Powerball uh, drawing. Um, it's hard to short. To short, you got to go locate the stock and you got to do all this stuff. And so hedge funds can't like react instantaneously if the stock goes up or something like that. And after the GameStop kind of fiasco and AMC, a lot of hedge funds just stopped shorting completely. Uh, most of the biotech hedge funds I know have just said, you know what, what's the point? Um, but the reality is drugs still fail. 98% of Alzheimer's drugs fail. We don't get that disease. Uh, we don't understand it. This thing has nothing to do with it. There's no chance. But you know, long buyers are still want to play lottery. They still want to scratch the edge. They don't want to invest. They want to gamble. The stock market's a casino to them, and that's fine. Uh, and if they want to gamble on this, you know, as we all know, the casino wins. <laughs> um, uh, I will write you the call options. I will write you the long stock that you want. And when the bill is due, the bill is due. Um, you might win for now, just like a, somebody might have a hot hand at blackjack. But like all gamblers, the the they will not be able to quit, and they will, you know, uh, ultimately meet their maker. 